I am going to spend the next hour talking to you a little bit about what I've learned over the last 10 years from working with teachers on classroom management. So we're going to cover some different topics. We're going to talk a little bit about cultural and contextual considerations when thinking about planning behavior supports for the classroom. We're going to talk about some of the basics. And then in the breakout session afterwards, I'm going to talk a little bit more about specifics. Introduction, foundations of evidence-based classroom management practices, lessons learned from training teachers in classroom management. Hopefully by the end of the day, by the end of this session, you should be able to describe the basics of evidence-based classroom management practices. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to identify um, answers to some of the questions that I've gotten over the years that teachers have posed to me. So you can take that back to your schools. I think that Amanda gave me a pretty good um, introduction. In addition to my illustrious career at Red Lobster, um, which, I, which I investigated after my graduation, my undergrad, my degree was in creative writing, piano. So um, I had to do something, so Red Lobster was the answer. So I spent about six years working there. And I can tell you, if you work with people with challenging behavior, food service is a great way to get some experience learning how to deal with people. Uh, hungry people are angry people. Um, so there's, there's a lot to be learned from the food service industry. It would be great if every teacher could do one year tour as a <laughs> server in a restaurant, and then they would be all set to deal with any behaviors that came their way. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about myself when we get later in the slides, but um, one of the reasons I am here today, one of the reasons I do the work I do with teachers and classroom management is because my first teaching job was actually at a residential facility for adjudicated delinquents, um, kids who had been locked up because of crimes. And when you work in a place like that, um, you don't really have any traditional punishers to rely on in the classroom because the kids are in jail. So there's not much you can do in terms of you can't call home and say your son had a bad day. You can't give them detention. Right? You can't really throw them out of class because there's literally no place for them to go. So you learn very quickly that if you want to increase the likelihood of appropriate behavior, you have to make it worth the student's while to engage in those behaviors that you want to see. Because just yelling at them isn't going to be super effective. If that had worked, they probably wouldn't be in jail in the first place. Right? So even back then, I didn't know, I'm embarrassed to say there was a time in my life when I didn't know what positive behavior supports was. I had no idea that such a thing even existed, but common sense told me that punishing these students who were already in jail wasn't going to be an effective way to manage their behavior. So I started thinking about how to get them to behave, how to make it worth their while to engage in appropriate behaviors. That led me to teaching in the public schools. I wanted to see what was going on. I spent some years teaching in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and while I was there, I saw that teachers were struggling a little bit with how to manage kids with challenging behavior in their classrooms. And I thought, well, maybe I could take what I've learned and learn more and work with teachers. And then for the last 10 to 12 years, I've been working with teachers both as a professor training pre-service teachers. I talk a lot to in-service teachers and try to get people thinking a little bit more instructionally about working with kids with challenging behavior. Of course, you're at a behavior support conference. You're here to learn about these things, so you're a very friendly crowd. A lot of the information I'm going to share with you today is from some crowds that have not been so friendly and so open-minded to thinking about supporting behavior in kind of a different way. So hopefully you can take some of this information back to your colleagues who may be a little more reticent to embrace a proactive and preventive mindset when it comes to supporting kids with challenging behavior. So do we need training in positive proactive classroom management? What do you think? Yes. Probably. Um, I think it's a good idea. Otherwise, you're going to wind up in this situation where we have no students because they've all been expelled. And if many of you, many of you have experience working with students with challenging behavior and you know that they are the students who need support the most. There is something weird going on with the PowerPoint in that it's advancing on its own. So if you see it, don't try to ignore that and just uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep a close eye on it. So what isn't positive and proactive classroom management? This is a, a very timely discussion. It's gonna follow up on some of what Ingrid said earlier. This is a sign from Argyle Independent School District, which is a, um, town south of where I live, 
And you will see, if you can't read the sign, it says, attention, please be aware that the staff at Argyle ISD are armed and may use whatever force is necessary to protect our students. So that, that's outside of a public elementary school in Texas. Okay, and it's not, it's not the only district that, that has this kind of sign outside. So um, I don't know what you know about Texas. You know, I live there now, but I spent the first 40 years of my life in New England, so I'm still getting used to things in Texas like this. Um, this is not positive and proactive behavior support, okay? This is something very different. This is not the answer to school violence. Like, violence begets violence, right? So arming our teachers, and, you know, the Santa Fe story, of course, was local news for me. I was home when that happened. And, um, you know, there were, there were armed officers very close by, and that didn't prevent it from happening. So not to... Um, this is not what the whole presentation is on, but I thought I would share a few of my thoughts on school violence, thinking about, you know, I was living in Connecticut when Newtown happened, and of course it's just exponentially increased since then. Our kids need help. And every time we see one of these stories, when we saw the Parkland story, um, it, you know, especially when it's a student who has a history of mental illness, who has um, shown signs of needs, and then people say things like, yeah, he was a little bit weird, or he was a little bit unpleasant or he might have been bullied. Um, those, those are some of the students we're talking about today. We're talking about supporting students' social and emotional needs. Our students need help and we are failing them. Having a massive response every time we have a school shooting is not, it's clearly not solving the problem. Okay, we need to do something different. Um, reactive approaches are not going to be successful. We know this. Okay, we've spent, those of us who work in positive behavior supports, we've spent the last two to three decades thinking about ways to be more proactive in the school setting. We need more prevention-oriented services in schools. We need to be thinking about screeners like we do for academics. We talk about positive behavior supports and tiered support. We should be screening students for possible issues. We should be teaching better coping and tolerance skills to our students because a lot of these students who are engaging in these behaviors are students who have had too much. They can't cope and tolerate anymore. That needs to be part of our curriculum in schools. And not optional, not like, oh, this school does this and this school doesn't. It needs to be something that we're doing in all of our schools nationwide. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you all wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that, but it's getting to be very, very serious. And I'm not sure when we're actually going to make a change and something else we need to think about, and I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit later, is that we need to be thinking about where we're directing our attention. So imagine if the news coverage for schools that did awesome things or that had 100% graduation rates or that had students who had high rates of college acceptance, imagine if those schools got the news coverage that every school that had a school shooting has, right? When we have school shootings, they are all over the news. And we are giving so much attention to these egregious acts that any student who wants attention knows exactly how to make that happen, whether it's threatening those kind of acts or actually engaging in them or engaging in behaviors that are likely to lead to those kinds of acts. Okay, so if we continue to pay attention to these behaviors and plaster them all over the news and talk about them all the time, students are gonna hear about these things. They're gonna be thinking about them constantly. When you're thinking about something constantly, you're much more likely to engage in those kinds of behaviors. We have to think about where we're directing our attention. Think about what a different conversation it would be if on the nightly news we saw amazing things that schools were doing. We saw great things that students were doing. We saw great acts of kindness or great acts of charity or we just saw students being normal students and getting through the day and graduating, right? But we only see schools on the news when it's bad news and unfortunately a lot of that news lately has been violence. So, back to classroom management. Just wanted to put that in there and Ingrid really, I think, had a great stance on that this morning and thinking about the reason that we're all here at this conference, it's bigger than just getting kids to behave in class. Even though that's what I'm here to talk about, it's bigger than that, okay? But it starts with us as educators, it starts with us as teachers, and unfortunately schools are the places where um, students are getting a lot of their mental health services. Okay, um, I have not completely solved the problem. I'm sure you saw that, so. Uh, around half of teachers, classroom management is really challenging. Thank you, Amanda. Classroom management is really challenging. 
about half of all, how many of you are within your first five years of teaching? Okay, so now so we've got some long-termers in the bunch, that's good. But out of all the people that raised their hand, probably half of them will not necessarily be here in five years because classroom management is hard, teaching is hard, okay? Um, one of the reasons that teachers leave the field so often is because of classroom management and challenges with classroom management. I don't know what they're doing back there. Um, we can't fix a lot of the things that are challenging for teachers. We can't pay you more, unfortunately. We can't make your jobs easier. We can't reduce the amount of paperwork. But one thing that we can do is have teachers, have teachers um, engage in evidence-based practices that are likely to increase appropriate behavior from their students. Okay, that's one factor that impacts the attrition of teachers that we can actually change. Okay, so we can't change your pay or the way that society views teachers. We can't change other things going on in schools, but we can actually equip teachers with a better skill set to increase the likelihood that students will behave better, which would likely reduce some teacher stress, keep them in the classroom a little bit longer. So why is classroom management hard? Training is insufficient and inefficient. Um, Educator preparation programs, like the one that I run at Texas Women's University, we are not as evidence-based as we should be. We are focused, like many of you are, on our students, our pre-service teachers passing the state tests. And so all of our curriculum, all of the courses that our students teach need to focus on those state tests. And as you may guess, classroom management is not a big focus on the state tests, okay? Professional development for people who are already teaching is a lot of train and hope. You sit at the beginning of the year, you have three days of professional development, they have somebody like me come out and talk to you for a few hours, and then you're supposed to go and implement behavior support in your classroom. And that's not feasible. We would never do that with our students and say, hey guys, fractions are really important. Here's how you do them. Have a good year. We would never do that to our students, but we do it with teachers all the time. And teachers have a lot of competing initiatives. So there's behavior support, there's instructional changes, there's curriculum developments. And we do a lot of, here's all this information, have a good time, good luck. And then your administrator wants to know in January why you're not doing these things. And a lot of the reason is there isn't any follow-up. Okay, so we need to change the way we prepare teachers who are in educator preparation programs. And we need to change the way that we're delivering professional development to teachers. Also, the more that learners practice behavior, the more efficient and effective the behavior becomes at meeting the learner's needs. This applies to both teachers and students, okay? The older students get, the more years they've had practicing behaviors that are inappropriate. They've learned how to get what they want through inappropriate behaviors. This happens for teachers as well, okay? So if you are the kind of teacher who, and you're not because you're here at this conference, so if you're the kind of teacher who removes kids from the classroom when they engage in inappropriate behaviors, you're gonna keep doing that because that's a very easy way to get rid of the student who's engaging in those appropriate behaviors. And if you've had years and years of practice doing that, you're very likely to continue doing that, okay? So when you work with teachers who have been doing this for a long time, okay, if they've been reactive when it comes to student behavior, um, they're gonna continue to do that. They need, the new behavior needs to be more effective for them than what they're doing right now. Behavior change can be really, really slow, okay? I will give you an example of what behavior change looks like in your real life, and then you can think about how it applies to teachers and to students. I promise I'm working, this is me like clicking back and forth so it doesn't keep advancing, so. Um, if I wanted to change, so think of a behavior that you engage in all the time. So for example, okay, you probably have a route that you take to work every day. When you drive to work, you probably take this route because it's efficient for you. You know the way, you know how long it's gonna take you to get to work, so if I say to you, hey, I would very much like for you to change the route that you take to work. The new way is gonna take you about 45 minutes to an hour longer, but it will ease congestion on I-91. Are you interested in my proposition? You are not very interested in my proposition, but it'll be good for the traffic flow. You don't care. You know how you get to work. You're gonna get there efficiently. You're not gonna take me up on my offer for 45 minute extension of your drive every day. However, if I say to you, 
listen, I want you to take this new route to work, okay? I'm gonna give you $400 every time you take this new way to work. Are you more interested in my proposal now? You're a little bit more interested, right? Because I have made it worth your while to change your behavior. So with students a lot, think about this with students, we say, you need to stop talking. And that's it, there's like nothing, that's it, that's the end of the deal. You need to stop talking, why? Because I wish, I wish you would. I would like it to be so. Okay, that's, not an, that's not a good deal for the student, okay? It's not a good deal for you if I say, you need to take this way to work, it's longer, but I would like you to do it. You're not interested in changing your behavior. If I put something in place that is of interest to you, like a $400 reward, you're going to be more likely to change your behavior, correct? Here's the thing, you're not gonna change your behavior immediately or automatically, okay? You're gonna need me to call you and say, hey, good morning, it's Diane, listen, don't forget, take your new route to work today, and you're gonna say, oh, that's right, that's right. Um, you're still gonna forget some days because you're so used to going the other way, I'm gonna have to put a picture of myself on your dashboard holding four $100 bills, so when you get in the car in the morning, right, I'm gonna to have to prompt you, I'm gonna to have to remind you, and you know what? Some days, you're gonna go the old way just because you feel like it. You're gonna take that, <laughs> you're gonna take that old route to work just because you feel like it. And they have this all on video, too, so you'll get to see my technique. <laughs> you can go back and watch me struggle all the time. It'll be so exciting for you. Um, maybe I'll go viral. Um, we'll see. Anyway, so you understand that even with this amazing reward in place of $400 a day, you're still going to need to set up the environment to increase the likelihood that you're going to engage in this new behavior. And some days you're still going to forget. You're going to have a lot on your mind. You're going to make mistakes. That's how behavior change works. It is slow. The new behavior has to result in something much better for you than the old behavior. And we have to expect some mistakes along the way. With kids, we don't apply that logic, right? We just say, stop talking. And that's not, it doesn't happen, right? So we need to make sure the new behavior is better, more efficient for the learner, results in better things than the old behavior. So sometimes we give mixed messages about the behavior we expect. So this is a book called No, No, Yes, Yes, as you can see from the title. Um, sometimes we don't all, and this goes back to what I was talking about, we have to be careful about what we're paying attention to. Okay, so this is a book uh, called No, No, Yes, Yes. This is a no, no behavior. Does this young man look like he's not enjoying himself? <laughs> that looks like a lot of fun. This is the appropriate behavior, but look at the inappropriate behavior. Smile, huge, meh, okay? Uh, the book goes on, I don't wanna spoil the whole book for you, there's really, there's no plot twist. This is the entire book, so. Like, look how much fun tearing up books is as opposed to reading books. Okay, unabashed joy for the tearing of the book, hanging out and reading, not so cool. Um, same thing here, bonking sister on the head, great big smile, looks like so much fun, sitting there, eh, it's just not as much fun. And then if you give this book to your child and then the kid starts beating his sister on the head with a hammer, you'd be like, why is this happening? The book said no. But look at, look at what we're running away from dad, no, no, don't do that, but look at the smile on the kid's face. Right? Um, yes, yes, okay, not, looks nice, but not as much fun. You see, the book goes on like this for, for many things. So, much more fun, and then a whole series of behaviors that are not supposed to be engaged in, but look at how much fun they are. Drawing all over yourself with mom's lipstick, look at the electric. If a, student, if a kid had never seen an electrical socket and then saw that picture, now he's going to have his curiosity peaked, right? And then the yes, yes things, they are, not quite as much fun as the no-no things, okay? Um, so, uh, one thing to consider, look at that. So collective awe for this young man. So I asked a very dear friend of mine if he had any pictures of his son to share with me. And this is the picture that he pulled out. And I said, oh, look at Nick, he's adorable and covered in chocolate, that's great. Um, and I said, do you have any other pictures? And he went through and they were all pictures of like food messes and assorted other things, which is not, they're all very adorable, but we think about the kind of behaviors we're paying attention to and, and preserving for posterity. A lot of those behaviors are things we may not wanna see too much of in the future, okay? So anyway. Think about the behaviors that we pay attention to and think about 
how hard it is to stop thinking about something once someone puts an idea in your head, right? This is part of the problem with the way that we've managed bullying um, in this country because we talk about bullying, no bullying, stop bullying, don't bully, bullies are bad, et cetera. There's no way that kids can get through the day without hearing that word at least once. Imagine the change in the conversation if it was be nice, be respectful, be nice, be respectful, always be respectful, make sure you're being respectful. And they heard about that as much as they heard about not bullying. It's very difficult to teach the absence of a behavior. Right? You can't teach not bullying. You can teach what to do instead. Okay? So that's what we need to be thinking about. Focus on the behaviors that you want to see. If you hang up a sign that says no unicycles beyond this point, very likely that you're going to start thinking about unicycles. Okay? <laughs> this is a slide I stole from George Sugai a million years ago. If you go into a school that says no food, no weapons, no backpacks, no drugs, no smoking, no bullying, what are you thinking about the second you go into that school? Think about food, drugs, weapons, bullying, smoking, okay? Instead of thinking about being safe, being responsible, and being respectful. Plus, the other thing is if this, this is your set of school rules, okay, and many of you know this already, this is not all encompassing, right? Nowhere up here does it say no setting up a slip and slide in the hallway to get from one class to the next, okay? So if you go out into the hallway and Johnny is sliding down to his next class and you say, hey man, you can't do that, and he's like, well, I don't have a backpack, I'm not smoking a cigarette, I don't have a weapon, and I'm not eating anything, so apparently I can, and you really don't have any legal leg to stand on in that case, right? He's 100% he's correct. So we need to focus on the behaviors that we want to see. And I'm guessing you wouldn't be at this conference if you felt differently. So, a few things about what I've learned from um, classroom management and from today with my clicker. Everyone has ideas about classroom management. So, I like to ask folks, when I start talking about classroom management, what good classroom management looks like, what poor classroom management looks like, and if classroom managers are born or made. Okay, I won't ask you to get in groups because we're limited on time and I'm having technical difficulties and I can't. But if you could sum up what good classroom management looks like in one word or so, what would you say? Engagement. Okay, so students are actively engaged in learning. That's good, right? Students who are engaged in appropriate behavior are not engaged in inappropriate behavior. They're mutually exclusive. What does classroom management that's less strong look like? When you walk into a classroom that's not well managed, how do you know? Yeah, what do you see? It's chaos. People aren't responding. You hear a lot of no, stop, don't. It's clear that the routines aren't taught. And this question, are good classroom managers born or made? What do you think about that? Well, I have to think they're made, right? Like, you all have a copy of this book in front of you that says evidence-based practices. Like, I, I have some stock in believing that you can actually teach people behaviors to increase the likelihood of classroom management success. I do think there's some innate qualities that make it more likely you're going to implement those practices more successfully, right? Having a good sense of humor is very helpful, especially if you're working with kids with challenging behavior. Being patient, being flexible, you never know when things are not going to work, like technology, okay? So you have to be able to kind of roll with the punches, as they say. I always try to get people to think about classroom management as part of a larger system. Okay? Classrooms do not operate in isolation in schools, even though it usually feels that way. Part of a larger system, and many of you are part of positive behavioral intervention and support systems in your school. Um, as you know, schools traditionally provide behavior support only to students who demonstrate problem behaviors. Uh, School-wide PBIS is based on the public health model of preventive multi-tier intervention. I think, how many of you are familiar with multi-tiered systems of support and PBIS? Okay, good. So we don't need to spend too much time, but whenever I do these kinds of trainings, everybody wants to know about those kids, right? And I say, well, this is a universal support training. And they say, but I want to know about those kids. I have this kid that does X, Y, and Z. And I'm not sure, and I try to explain this when I talk to groups of teachers, that we don't have like a secret recipe or potion that we use with students who have more intensive behavioral needs. We do the same stuff, we just do more of it and we do it more often. So we use what we know in terms of behavior support, what we know in terms of reinforcement, and we do that more intensively, more frequently, and in a more individualized fashion as kids' behavior needs increase. 
So you've all seen the triangle, I'm assuming. And if not, we can talk later, we can talk at lunch. What I want you to know, if you take this back to your faculty, you take this back to schools, and any of you who do training know this already, is that this applies to teachers as well. Okay, so if you are doing training in any kind of behavior support system, about 80% of the teachers or educators whom you speak to will buy in. They'll be excited, they'll be ready to use data to make decisions, they will be implementing behavior supports with fidelity. Okay, about 15% or so may need a little bit of a push. They're gonna need the person next door to them to be doing these things, to be engaging in appropriate behavior supports. They're gonna need to see some data. They're gonna need to have it made a little bit simpler for them. Okay, and then you're gonna have the 5%. Okay, these are the folks who just aren't having it. They didn't have that positive behavior stuff when I was in school and I'm not doing it either. I'm not rewarding these kids for what they should be doing anyway. Okay, some of you are nodding like, like you're waiting to see that person tomorrow when you go back to work, right? So, and this exists, I mean, so 5%, these are gonna be folks that just, aren't, this is where if you really wanna do something school-wide, the administrators need to get involved. And because think about it if that person's like, you know, I'm not teaching reading, reading is stupid, I'm not teaching it, I'm just not doing it. No one would let that go by, right? People would make that teacher do what he or she was supposed to do. If you really want a school-wide system to work, you need to do the same thing. So I like to get teachers thinking about the basics of behavior. So thinking about how behavior works. And unfortunately, when we train teachers in behavior support, we don't talk to them about the mechanisms behind behavior. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit in my breakout section, but we don't talk to teachers about antecedents, consequences, positive reinforcement, and we should. Because I've been talking to teachers about it for 10 years and no one's ever said, wait, that doesn't really make sense. For some reason, only special ed teachers get those behavior courses. And we're not doing a good job of pushing out that information to our general education teachers. But never have I met a general education teacher who didn't understand or was unable to apply this information. Um, so traditional classroom ma management training shortchanges teachers. Understanding how behavior works is critical to having an effective classroom management system using a lot of applied examples. Teachers need to understand the three-term contingency, antecedent behavior consequence. They need to understand setting up the environment to increase the likelihood of appropriate behavior. And then we do that every day with positive behavior interventions and supports. We teach our students what they need to know. We make sure that we have our system set up. We need to make sure that we're talking about behavior in observable and measurable terms. Okay, being nice is not a behavior. Being respectful is not a behavior. We need to make sure that we're using language around behavior that is objective, okay, that is measurable, and that we can see what's going on with our students. Consequences are what are actually going to increase or decrease the likelihood of a behavior in the future. That's that $400 I'm giving you for taking that new route to work. Hopefully that's gonna increase the likelihood of your behavior in the future. Okay. Teachers need to understand how antecedents increase or decrease the likelihood of behaviors, how consequences impact the future likelihood of behaviors, setting events, extinction, and function. I'm gonna talk about those terms a little bit in the breakout section, but it's not overly complicated, and it's something that if teachers can understand it, it will increase the likelihood that their behavior support is gonna be effective. One thing that I think we neglect to tell, especially our pre-service teachers, is that social behavior change is not different from academic change. Behavior is behavior, whether it's learning how to do math or whether it's learning how to do social skills, okay? They need to be taught. There's going to be mistakes along the way. We have to expect mistakes. We have to give a lot of feedback, okay? You would never teach students how to identify latitude and longitude lines. I'm just tell them, well, the latitude lines go this way and the, the latitude lines go this way and the longitude lines go this way. There you go. You would not just have that be the extent of your life. You'd have them look at a globe. You'd have them practice. You'd have them find places on the globe. But with behavior, we just say, line up quietly. And that's the extent of our instruction. Students don't have a chance to practice, they don't have a chance to get feedback, okay, but behavior is behavior. Now I know that yelling out a curse word in class is much more annoying than a student not being able to locate 
the latitude and longitude of Cape Town, South Africa. Like I know that one of those behaviors is much more annoying than the other, but if as educators we can approach them the same way and think about how these are just skills that students need to learn, we know how to teach. We know how to teach, we know how to set objectives, we know how to give students a chance to practice, we know how to give feedback, and we know. It's the end of the school year now, right? How many of you are aware of students in your building that are still struggling to pick up academic content they should have learned back in September, okay? And if you're not raising your hand, I know it's because you're not really listening to me anymore. So that's, that's, that's what I know is going on. So we know that there are students who are still struggling. It's May, it's almost June, and there are still students who are struggling. And we're not mad at those students. We wish they were doing better, but we're not angry. And I bet you've spent all year, or someone in your building has spent all year trying to get that student to do better, to meet curriculum objectives, to meet grade level benchmarks. But with behavior, we are not that patient and we do not have that mindset of trying to support kids to be successful. But with students who are having a hard time with academic progress, we continue to support and we cheer them on. But kids who aren't making the behavior progress, we're not as patient. But those are both skill sets that students are learning and students are going to struggle. Some students struggle with academic behavior, some students struggle with social behavior, some students struggle with both. Okay, but we need to be thinking from that instructional mindset for both social and academic behavior. Okay? Um, classroom management needs to be culturally relevant. So if you're gonna implement classroom management practices, whether it's what you do or your own practices or the evidence-based ones I'm talking about today, you have to consider the context and the culture of where you are implementing these things. Now, talking to teachers about culture can be difficult. Teachers don't like to talk about culture a lot of times. Um, the culture and race are not the same thing, right? Race is biological. Culture is a product of where you live, who you're around, how you were raised. But people get very nervous because race can be part of the cultural discussion. And I've had these discussions a lot, a lot of different places all over the country. But people get nervous. They don't like to talk about these things. They'll say things like, I don't see color. And I say, well, you do, like, unless you're colorblind, which I'll give you a pass, but unless that's the case, in fact, you are going to see color. And that's okay. Like, noticing that people are of different races doesn't make you a racist. Treating them differently because of that, that's the racist part, okay? That's the part that makes you a racist. It's not just noticing that people have different racial backgrounds, okay? It's treating them differently based on that. That's the dangerous part. And until we can have some open and honest conversations about it, we're not going to get much further, okay? Um, difficult conversations are unpleasant. If they don't happen, we won't move forward. Uh, be mindful of your audience. I've had to um, change the way I talk about, so when I talk about culture and race, I usually use an example. I didn't here, but... Um, like I talk about the Fresh Prince and Carlton, right? And how they're both African-American, but they have wildly different cultures, right? And when I first moved to Texas, I always use this example about myself and the Duck Dynasty guys. And I was like, we're white, but we have these different cultures. And then people were like, I, I don't know that. And I was like, oh, oh, because in Texas, the Duck Dynasty culture is not uncommon. So I had to change it up, and now I talk about myself and the Real Housewives of Orange County and how we're all white. We definitely don't share the same. But I learned that very quickly. And if you're not uh, familiar with Texas, I want to share with you some of the cultural differences between Connecticut and Texas. The first thing you need, well, I'll, let's go through some of these. I'm not sure how the slides are going to advance, so I don't want to give it away. But in Texas, the language is different. Okay, We use a lot of extra words, like in New England, we say things like, where are you guys? I can do that, I'm going to the store. These same very common phrases sound very different when you are in Texas. So instead of where are you guys, it's where are all y'all, which seems redundant, but you know, it's just what you say. Uh, instead of saying, I can do that, you say, I might could do that. We just put words in there that don't belong there. And then instead of I'm going to the store, it's I'm fixing to go to the store, which makes no sense to me in any grammatical context whatsoever. <laughs> And if you talk to people that are lifelong Texans, they just say, I'm fitting to go to the store, which I'm not even sure phonetically what that, what's going on there. Um, so those are just some 
linguistic differences between New England and Texas. Um, state pride, Texas has a lot of state pride. So the first time I was working in a school district there, um, you know, I, I said the Pledge of Allegiance and blah, blah, blah. I stumbled my way through it because I don't remember it that well. And then they said, turn and face the Texas flag. And I was like, wait, what? And so I had, and then they have a Texas Pledge of Allegiance. So you pledge the Texas flag, which is weird. Um, also, I don't know what you guys know about tattoos, but this is what you get when you Google Connecticut tattoos. I know, and I found it on a site called the 50 Worst Tattoos. Um, conversely, if you Google Texas tattoos, uh, this is what you get page after page after page of Texas tattoos, and almost everyone I know down there has one. It's, it's a very big deal. Uh, mums are the last thing I want to talk about in terms of Texas. So when I say mums to you, you probably think fall, and you think these lovely plants that you put out on your porch, the first fall I spent in Texas, people started talking about mums, and they were very excited about mums. And there was a lot of kibitzing about how expensive the mums were, and I was confused because that's what mums are. So I didn't know, and then homecoming weekend arrived, and I saw some mums, and that's what a mum is. Your confusion is correct. <laughs> Those my friends, my Connecticut friends, my people, uh, those are mums. Those are mums. So these are what the girls wear to the homecoming weekend dance and football game. So the cheerleaders will actually go out with, are there any people here who can verify that this is a real thing? Any native tech? Thank you very much. Please see that this is, this is a legitimate thing and I did not make this up. And it's only Texas, like even Oklahoma, I live 30 minutes from Oklahoma and they don't know anything about the moms. It is a strictly Texas thing. And the point being, this is the same country, okay? We, I got on a plane yesterday and flew here from where I live and it, you know, it was three and a half hours. And the language is different, the culture is different, people walk through the town square with guns on their back where I live, which is weird. It's very, very different. Okay, so think about kids who are coming in to a different culture. Think about kids who are moving from a different place in the country. Think about kids that are moving to your schools from different countries. If it's this confusing for somebody in her 40s to move from one part of the country to the next, think about how confusing it is for kids to jump cultures. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're specific about our behaviors that we want to see. We're not just saying be respectful because in different cultures that means different things. Being respectful in Texas means saluting the Texas flag. I don't know, I didn't know that until I went there. Okay? We need to be very clear about our expectations because if these are the kind of differences we see in our own country, imagine what kids are seeing when they're moving from place to place. If you are of the mindset that people from the same culture will behave the same way. I need to disavow you of that right now. Um, we do this, again, I know I'm talking to a friendly crowd, but we a lot of times assume that because people share traits of one culture that they're gonna behave the same way. We do overgeneralizing, right? Um, the reason that that's a mistake is because not everybody's gonna behave the same way just because they share some cultural characteristics. And if you need further evidence of that, I want you to think about brothers and sisters if you have them, or think about people you know who have siblings. You probably share as much culture as you possibly could with this other person. You have at least one of the same parents, you grew up in a similar place, you went to the same schools, you practice the same religion. If you had a religion, you have the same traditions. I'm willing to bet that even as much culture as you and your siblings share, you do not behave the same way all the time. And there is no way that any two people could have more cultural similarities than you and your siblings, but you still behave differently. So it is irresponsible and just plain wrong for us to assume that people who share aspects of a culture are going to behave similarly. It's just, it's just factually inaccurate. So um, how your culture shapes you, I want you to think about your own culture and you're bringing a lot of cultural baggage to the classroom, to the school with you every single day. Where you were raised, for instance, your early experiences, your educational experiences, your professional experience, all of this shapes how you behave in the classroom every day. It shapes how you behave in any interaction you have with other people. Okay? For instance, my own, I'm not going to bore you with the mundane details of my life, but a few things to think about. 
Um, I grew up in North Adams, Massachusetts. I don't know if any of you know where that is. It's in Western Massachusetts. Um, I have a better chance of people knowing where that is here than like in Texas where they just think Massachusetts is Boston, just one giant <laughs> Boston. Um, when I was in high school at Mount Greylock Regional High School, they had a program called A Better Chance. And what this program was is they brought kids from, it was called the ABC program, and they brought kids from New Bedford, Massachusetts, to our high school. So there were Mount Greylock Regional High School, very homogeneous, by which I mean all white, very homogeneous high school. And they would bring these kids in who were African American, and they would come to our school. And I remember, so I was like 14, and I remember this is one of my first sort of cultural awakenings. And I remember talking to these students and thinking like, why is my high school better than your high school? Like, why do you have to come to my high school to have a better chance? And more disturbingly, what about all the other kids back at your high school? So early on, like I started seeing that there was this sort of divide between my experiences and the same experiences of people my age who just happened to live in a different place, who happened to belong to different cultures, okay? Um, when I was working with kids on parole right here in Hartford, Connecticut, um, one of our charges was to go around and talk to kids. We had to check on kids in school. We had to check on them after school. We had to check on them at night. And I was on the north end of Hartford, uh, right off of Albany Avenue, which many of you probably know about. And one of my parolees that I was checking on, I was in my little Honda Civic. I pulled up to him, and he leaned in my passenger side window, and I was asking him how his day went and taking notes and this and that. And then the next thing I knew, some police had rolled up on us, and we were out of the car with our hands. And I was like, what, what's happening, Alexi? And he was like, don't worry about us. And I was like, what? This is weird, but I'm, but I'm just checking on him. I'm his case manager. And of course, they thought I was buying drugs because I was white, and I was in an all-black neighborhood. And that's what happens. And what was disturbing was not that this happened to me, but how nonchalant he was about it, because of course that happens. Of course that was going to happen. Um, and so I really started thinking about how different your experiences can be just based on where you live and how, I mean, it's, it's, I've had a lot of different experiences in my life, but there's, there's been some that have really sort of stood out. I told you I taught in Bridgeport, I transitioned to higher education, I moved to Texas, a lot of different things happened. Um, my very, prior to Red Lobster, that was my second sort of big gig, but my first job was being a housekeeper in a hotel at Jiminy Peak, which some of you, I forget that you guys actually may know these places that I, I usually skip over mentioning. And um, I was 14, and my friend Ethan and I were spraying each other with Lysol in the hallway. We were just messing around, and the head housekeeper came out and said, stop treating this job like a joke. It's how I feed my family. And she was right. And I had to really check myself because, for me, it was just a stupid summer job, but for other people, that was their job, and that was their livelihood. And for me to act like it was a joke, was not okay. And these kind of, I bring all of this with me every day. And it's important for you as educators to think about what's going on in your little cultural bubble. How have the things you've been through shaped you and changed you and made you the person you are? And not only you, all of the students that are in your schools are bringing all of this stuff with them every single day. They're thinking about socioeconomic status in Texas, especially immigrant status, as you can imagine, is a very big deal right now with all of the changes that are coming. Family structure, language, disability, values and beliefs. Kids are contending with all of this and shaping their culture. Your culture is gonna change over the course of your life, of, but think about all of the cultural baggage kids are bringing and then combined with yours, it's a mess. Or it can be, unless you're very planful about your classroom culture and thinking about how you make it a space where all of this baggage can be accommodated. Thinking about, are we having consequences that make sense? Are we actually teaching the behaviors we wanna see? Is our classroom arranged appropriately? Are our materials culturally relevant? Are our expect expectations clear? Can all students have access to the supports that they need? Are we modeling appropriate relationships with other adults, with students? One thing to think about is this culturally relevant instruction and materials. Again, this is something that I've noticed a lot in Texas, like when I went to a Civil War museum down there and it was all Confederate stuff. And I was like, well, this is weird. You guys, this is the wrong war. Like, I'm confused. Like, I don't, because up here, you know, it's just if you go to anything. So that's very different. And then think about the kind of materials where you're, you're using. And I talk about Freedom Riders a lot. Do, how many of you are familiar with Freedom Riders? Many of you. So. Freedom Riders is this movie, uh, well, it was a real story, it was a book, and then a movie about this uh, white teacher, Aaron Gruwell, who's very well-to-do, 
And she went and taught in an urban, urban school with some difficult kids, which is a euphemism for poor students of color. And um, the, I see this movie a lot, like in high school curricula, and I see it, um, you know, a lot of the students I've had, both when I was a, a professor here in Massachusetts and then now, People love this movie, and it's very inspiring to them. And it's a great story. Erin Gruel went in, and she took these difficult kids, and then they all started writing, and they did these amazing things, and then they wrote a book about her. It was so wonderful that they made a movie about her. And Hilary Swank played her in the movie. She won an Oscar. It's a great big deal. But when I see that movie, I see something a little bit different. And it's based on my own experiences and what I bring to the table in terms of what I've seen and where I've worked, and it's that I don't think that, first of all, I don't think Freedom Riders would exist if Aaron Gruel had been black or those students had been white. So I think that's, that's a different issue. But I don't think that being able to reach poor students of color and make them achieve great things should be so monumental and mythical that it deserves a book and a movie. I think that should be the expectation for teachers, right? Like I think, <laughs> thank you, please. Please don't, tell, please don't tell Aaron Gruel I said any of that. I still have But do you know what I'm saying? Like when we make movies and we exalt these people, like you're a hero if you can teach poor black kids. Like no, like we all should be doing that very same thing. Like it's kind of offensive when you really think about it from that lens, but that's what cultural relevance means. To me, that movie means something very different than it might mean to somebody who's thinking about going into teaching and wants to be inspired. But that should be the expectation. People that can reach difficult kids should be normal. Like, we have skills we can teach people to make them able to do that. It shouldn't be so unusual that it warrants all of this movie, book, et cetera. Okay. Um, culture and relationship building are inextricably linked. Cultural relevance is in the eye of the beholder. People will say weird things when you were talking about this. I had a woman tell me at a training that her school had a lot of behavior problems because the kids were all from single parent families. And I said, well, I, you know, my parents got divorced when I was nine, so I, you know, I, some, some of us turned out okay. Like, you know, it's, but you can't, people will say things and you have to use those moments to teach them a different behavior, okay? Um, all right. So with all of that in mind, thinking about our charge as educators, supporting kids, in their social and emotional needs, thinking about behavior instruction as just instruction, not different from academic instruction. I want to spend the last few minutes just reviewing evidence-based practices in classroom management and just touch on a couple of the things that I think are very, very important for you to take away from this morning. So we have grouped, we've done a lot of research in this area, me and my colleagues at UConn and so forth. When we talk about Evidence-based practices in classroom management. Now you all have the books, so I don't need to go too far into detail. By the way, I get six cents per copy on the books. I know. Woo! I'm upgrading to first class on the way home. Um, we talk about maximizing structure, identifying, defining, and teaching our expectations, increasing our engagement. We want to have a continuum of supports to increase the likelihood of appropriate behavior and also supports to decrease the likelihood of inappropriate behavior. Um, when we talk about structure and expectations, most of that is the embedded structure of the classroom in terms of your routines. Again, I'm going to talk more about these in the breakout session, and they're in great detail in the book if you need to refer to anything. Um, these are just strategies to increase the likelihood of behavior. They're not going to increase or decrease it in the future. You're just trying to set up the classroom to increase the likelihood of the behavior happening. Um, you need to make sure you have clearly defined expectations. People know the behaviors that you want to see. We use a matrix. Many of you have probably seen something similar where we list our expectations, but then we define them in the context of routines. If you just tell people to be respectful, they don't necessarily know what that means. I was doing a training at a school in Massachusetts many years ago, and I couldn't, it was a small private religious school, and I wasn't sure why I was there. And they said, um, you know, we're having some issues. So I asked them, the faculty, I said, what are, what are some of the things that are going on? And one of the teachers in the back raised her hand. She said, my students are being disrespectful. And I said, oh, OK, tell me what that looks like. And she said, they're talking about math during study hall. So, and I'm coming from somebody who's worked with kids on parole. And I was like, 
maybe she misheard me, and, uh, but she wasn't. So that, that behavior to her was disrespectful. This is why context is everything, okay? So we worked through the process and we said, well, let's define what respectful behavior looks like, and that looks like being silent during study hall. But if I had just let her say disrespect and not pushed her for a more operational definition of that behavior, I would have not known what she was talking about. Where I came from, disrespect meant you were lighting someone else on fire, right? So this was a very different sort of environment. But expectations are contextually and culturally relevant. So we need to make sure we're taking all of that into account. You can't just hang the matrix up, by the way. You actually have to teach those expectations. It does not just, being around it does not, in fact, improve behavior. Um, we need to keep our students actively engaged. That was the first thing you said when I asked you what good classroom management looks like. So I don't think I need to spend much time on here. What I want to talk about is this concept of reinforcement, because this is where you always get this question. Why are we rewarding kids for what they should be doing anyway? And the older, that, the older students get, the more likely they are to have teachers who aren't interested in rewarding their appropriate behaviors. So, Here's what I tell these teachers when they ask this question. So you may take this information and do with it what you will. So I actually, because I like tiered systems of support, I have a three-tiered response to this question. So why are we reinforcing kids for what they should be doing anyway? Here's what I tell them. The first thing is everyone likes to be told that he or she is doing a good job. When your administrator comes through your classroom and says, hey, the kids were really engaged today, that feels good. We give away presidential medals of freedom. We give away trophies. We give away, you know, best dog in show. Like people like to be told they're doing a good job. Okay, that's universal. We've been doing it forever. Okay, if you fill out feedback on this presentation this morning, besides the technical issues, if you say, hey, she did a good job, I'm going to feel good about that. If you say she did a bad job, I'm going to take that data and use it to make better decisions in the future. Um, but everyone likes to be told that he or she is doing a good job. As teachers, you like it when your students or your students' parents especially acknowledge that they've had a good year or they've learned something. That may not be enough for teachers, though. Okay, so first tier, everyone likes to be told he or she is doing a good job. Second tier is that most of what we have learned is due to reinforcement. So if you think back to when you learned to read, which you may not remember, but I'm going to tell you how it happened, you were looking, people kept putting stuff in front of you, and it was print, and you didn't really know what it was, and they kept saying things, and they were trying to get you to make this and that match up, and you didn't know what was going on until one day something clicked, and you said, oh, 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 k -a -t cat and everybody went crazy, and they were very excited, and oh my god, you're reading, and that's amazing, and you're like, oh my goodness, look at all this contingent attention I'm getting for reading, this is great, let me try it again, cat, and people were excited, and then you generalize that skill to dog, and people got excited, and eventually, the decoding part was not as exciting, but then you started putting words together, and then you started reading sentences, and then you started writing, and that was cool, and now you just keep reading because the, re the relationship is already there, we call that stimulus control, that's a whole nother talk, but if, no, if you had just read that, if you had just been home and you had said k -a -t cat and nothing had happened, you probably wouldn't have engaged in that behavior again. It was being reinforced for that behavior that increased the likelihood, and that's how you learn to read. That's how you learn to do almost everything that you do, okay? And if teachers don't like that, if they still keep pushing and they say kids need to behave just because it feels good to behave and they should be intrinsically motivated to behave, I have to go to my tier three response, which is this. We all love students. We love to teach, most of us. Okay? We, we went into teaching with the noblest of intention. We want to help people. And it feels good. And most of the time, our jobs are very rewarding. However, that's the intrinsic part. However, if we stopped getting paid for doing those jobs, we would probably stop doing them. And that's not because we're awful people, but it's because that extrinsic motivation is very powerful. The intrinsic stuff is what keeps us where we are instead of going to a different place or, you know. But that extrinsic motivator is very powerful. So to think that kids don't need something extrinsic to engage in certain behaviors is probably not gonna get you very far. The other thing that teachers are concerned about when it comes to reinforcing appropriate behavior is that it's not going to be fair to all students, right? So if you have a student who has more inappropriate behaviors than another student, and you have this student on a behavior plan and you're rewarding appropriate behaviors, teachers will always say, well, what about Jimmy over here? He's always behaving appropriately and he never gets, how many of you know the argument I'm talking about? So you're all nodding. So 
And what I used to tell teachers to say was, tell Jimmy that all students in this class get what they need, and some need glasses to see the board, and some need bigger notes to be able to follow along. And I like that answer, but I've developed a better answer over the years, which I'll share with you. So when a teacher says, you know what, I really want to reward Johnny for what he's doing because he's always off task, but then Jimmy's going to get mad, I say this. So Jimmy is what we know as a hater. Okay, so Jimmy, that's the clinical term for that, okay? So Jimmy, who's over there like, how come Johnny gets a sticker for raising his hand? I raise my hand every day and I don't get a sticker. I want a sticker. That's hating, right? He's hating on, on Johnny. So the teacher in that circumstance needs to say, listen, Jimmy, I understand and I appreciate that you usually do raise your hand. The skill I want you to work on is being happy for Johnny. So when Johnny raises his hand and gets a sticker, I want you to say, hey man, good job, and then Jimmy can have a sticker, okay? Because we all know Jimmy. Jimmy grows up into the adult who looks at the pictures on your Facebook feed and is like, mm, must be nice to be on vacation. Ooh. <laughs> at, a conference, at a conference on a Monday instead of being at work, must be nice. Two three-day weekends in a row for you, must be nice. That's Jimmy. Jimmy grows up into that adult. And if you don't know adults like that, it's you, okay? <laughs> so I want you to keep that in mind. Like that is a teachable moment. You can prevent that by focusing on what Jimmy should be doing instead. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going to go through this some quickly. The last thing I want to talk about a little bit is discouraging inappropriate behavior. And I've touched on this a little bit. But remember, when kids make mistakes, whether it's an academic mistake or a social mistake, we need to train ourselves to respond the same way. When a student spells something wrong, we don't say, quit spelling that word wrong. Okay, we have them try again, and then we respond, and we say, okay, let me give you some feedback. And if the student continues to struggle, we help to remediate. Okay, but our initial response isn't to reprimand. Our initial response is to have them try again. So if the student spells the word incorrectly and then spells it correctly the second time, we say, okay, good job, and we move on, no big deal. We need to respond to behavior errors the same way. And again, I understand a misspelled word is not the same thing as the F word. I understand those are two different behaviors and they're going, but if we can just say, hey, that's not, why didn't you tell me that was just going crazy back there? No one even pointed out that the thing was going crazy. If you can tell, if you can just treat behavior errors like, hey, you made a mistake, try it again, okay, that's right, you're gonna have a much different tenor in the classroom, okay? I can't believe none of you pointed out that this was just going crazy behind me. It's okay, you're all used to it by now, right? Like you've just been watching this the whole time. The good news is they're recording it so you can go back and watch all of the content. Uh, learners are gonna make mistakes. We need to provide feedback. We need to emphasize what is being done well and not always focus on what's not going well. As teachers, as educators, we're kind of programmed to do that. As a society, we're programmed to do that. That's why no, no, yes, yes is a bestseller, right? But we need to do better and use error correction not just for academic mistakes but for social mistakes. A few final considerations when responding to problem behavior. Punishment doesn't teach anything. Being reactive doesn't teach you what you should be doing. It just shows people what they shouldn't be doing. That's not helpful. We can't assume traditional punishments reduce problem behaviors. If they did, we wouldn't have problem behaviors, okay? Frequent use of punishment leads to a hostile learning environment. We should spend most of our time on prevention. Think about our own behavior. As teachers, it's our behavior that needs to change. Okay, that will affect student behavior change. Be consistent, always look for opportunities for reinforcement, and always think about the function of behavior. What are students trying to get or get away from with their behaviors? I'll talk about that more in the breakout section. A few last words of advice, model the practices you're teaching. When I go into schools and a teacher's like, stop yelling, that's problematic. <laughs> okay, you're not modeling the behaviors that you wanna see. Again, remember that those kids still need the universal level of support. Okay? Uh, bullying needs to be framed as a behavior and not a social phenomenon that we cannot, that we cannot deal with. It's a behavior like any other, okay? Um, being mad or sad about bullying or anything, school violence, anything for that matter, isn't actually going to change it. Intervention is what changes behavior, okay? 
Remind teachers that generalization is the goal of all teaching. That's really important. And the last thing I'll share with you, if you are really good at managing behavior, and many of you are, the true test is not that students are doing well in your classroom. It's that they take those skills and do well somewhere else. Because if they're just doing well with you, that's great, but they're eventually going to leave you. And they're eventually going to graduate and go on to the next grade or the next class or whatever. We, and as somebody who used to teach kids with emotional and behavioral disorders, I used to be like, well, they behave for me, but not anybody else. That's not OK. They need to be able to generalize those skills to other settings. And that's how you know you're really doing a good job. OK. Um, thank you very much. My email is on there. I am going to just leave you with a couple of resources, which is I, you guys have the handout. I know there's more stuff in there that was in the handout, but I took the liberty of changing some things around apparently including the transitions from slide to slide. Uh, thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. I hope you have a wonderful conference, and thank you for doing all of the work that you are doing.